Institutes at the CU Comprehensive Cancer Center. And um, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the uh, Cancer Center Symposium Series for 2022. Um, there is CME credit available for this. If you have any questions about this, you can ask Adela, but I think she's also putting some notes in the chat about that. So it's my honor today to introduce Dr. John Salmon. John completed his bachelor's at Harvard in chemistry and physics. He went on to get his MD from the University of Rochester. He completed a, a residency in medicine at the University of New Mexico. Then he went back to Harvard for his MPH and a research fellowship in clinical epidemiology. He then returned to the University of New Mexico and he moved through the ranks of assistant and associate professor, becoming pulmonary division chief in 1986 and playing a major role in the SEER cancer registry in New Mexico. It was at the end of his time there at UNM that I first met John. He was recruiting me to UNM, but he accepted a position of professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Some of you who are around my very, very young age may remember that there was uh, Timbuktu had a hit song in 1986 called The Future So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shades. So I asked John at this time if his future was so bright, he had to wear shades. And he very seriously said, I don't know what that means. But given that he's a jazz aficionado, if you didn't know that, um, this was not an entirely surprising uh, response. But now I have the answer to that somewhat rhetorical question. His future was so bright that he did need to wear shades. In addition to heading up epidemiology at Johns Hopkins, he was the co-director of various centers, the Center for Epidemiology and Policy, the Risk Sciences and Public Policy Institute, and the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. In 2008, he moved on to USC, where among his other duties, he chaired the Department of Preventive Medicine and was the director of the USC Institute for Global Health. And that brings us to his current position, as you all know him, as Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health. So in addition to all this kind of, you know, titles and um, academic positions, John has been a very productive researcher. He has many books, book chapters, monographs, advisory panels, around 400 published papers, and almost as many case reports, letters, and editorials. And a theme throughout his career has been respiratory illness with a long-term focus on lung cancer. So we're very fortunate today to have someone like John who has an in-depth working knowledge of this field to present radon and lung cancer, still a problem in Colorado. So John, please. Great. Thanks so much, Linda. Thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. And no, I'd never listened to Timbuktu. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, so what, what I'm going to do is uh, sort of tell a very long story about um, radon and lung cancer and this part of the uh, country. And it's a story I've sort of lived through in large part because I finished up my residency at UNM and then went back and spent 16 years on the faculty just as the uh, uranium mining industry was cresting in New Mexico and then fell in 1980 after Three Mile Island and the uh, cancellation of the development construction of many, many nuclear power plants across the uh, world. So I'm gonna start off and just offer you the reminder that um, radon, radon progeny was the first lung carcinogen. And there's this incredibly interesting documentation that dates back to the 1500s with Paracelsus, who described a problem of the mysterious illness, mountain sickness, Berg, mountain disease, Bergenkrite, in miners in the Carpathian Mountains, sort of uh, Bavaria, if you will. And he noted that sometimes one woman had seven husbands, not at once, but serially, uh, because they died. And that disease will turn out to be likely, is likely both lung cancer, silicosis, and silico TB. It was in 1879 that the pathology of this disease was described, and it was a cancer that involved the lungs, a paper by Harding and uh, Hesse and these miners uh, in Schneeberg on the uh, German side of the Earth's uh, mountains. 
Radon itself was described by the chemist Dorn. Uh, it was described as radium emanation because it's a gas that comes from the uh, decay of radium in the uh, uranium-234 decay series. At the start of the 20th century, the same problem of lung cancer in minors was identified on the other side of, oh, I'm sorry, was linked in the uh, German side to high levels of radon there. And soon thereafter, the same problem was noted on what would be called the Czech side of the mountain range uh, at, this, uh, at this point. In the United States, we began mining uranium in the 40s. Actually, the, the, the uranium for the bombs, the original bombs dropped in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and of course, at the Trinity site, that came from the uh, Congo. But the Colorado Plateau had long been the site of uh, mining of vanadium and other, um, other metals, and uranium was known to be present, and it was mined uh, by the uh, Manhattan Project, essentially. Problems uh, that were noted in the future began to emerge, like using uh, waste mine tailings as foundation material in Grand Junction and other communities on the Navajo uh, Reservation, uh, legacies we're still dealing with. In the uh, 1950s, in the early 1950s, the US Public Health Service began a study, a follow-up study, a cohort study of underground uranium miners in the Colorado uh, Plateau, a study that uh, still uh, continues to this date, and that was influential in providing some of the first warnings that we had a lung cancer problem in the Colorado Plateau miners. And this is Vic Archer, um, who was one of the originators of the study. Now, the radon furor began in the early 80s when a home was identified with levels of radon as high as those in the underground uranium mine, the home, in fact, of Stanley Watrous, who uh, made his career after this in the uh, radon measurement and mitigation uh, business. But here's uh, Stan in front of his home. This was picked up because he was setting off the radiation detectors at the Limerick, Pennsylvania power plant, nuclear power plant, where he worked uh, as he went to work not as he was uh, leaving work. And this was probably because of radon progeny uh, stuck to his clothing or that he was uh, exhaling. EPA set a concentration guideline that we still have. I'm not gonna go through the units, but this is a unit of uh, radioactivity. And uh, that standard at the time guideline became very controversial because of the call for essentially testing of all homes in the United States for radon and mitigation of the concentration was above that level. Now, in terms of trying to understand the risks of radon, the National Academy of Sciences, National Academies has had a series of committees on the risks of radiation, uh, most recently called the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation or beer committees. And I'm gonna talk about these because they've been an important vehicle for turning the science, um, using the science to support uh, policy measures. So Beer uh, 4 was the first in-depth look at uh, radon, and th the report was being done just at the time when uh, the radon frenzy about indoor radon um, hit. I actually led the efforts of this committee to understand uh, the risks of uh, radon and we'll sort of keep you posted on how that story has evolved. In 1990, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act or RECA was passed that compensated uh, former miners for certain diseases. And I'm gonna come back to that. And I'll note that RECA is due to expire in this year and there's now a discussion about uh, sustaining it to provide compensation for the underground miners and millers uh, and their families. Uh, beer four was followed uh, by beer six, uh, which I chaired, which addressed uh, radon and set the standard still used for modeling uh, the risks of radon. We're about to update that, I think. <clears throat> 
and then begin to pull together data sets on indoor radon and lung cancer, uh, something that we started thinking about perhaps 30 years ago as people began to say, well, what about the risks of um, indoor radon? Can we directly measure them using epidemiological uh, approaches? So that is a very quick background on uh, the uh, evolution of radon. I'm gonna show you some pictures because this is such an important part of the history of Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and other states um, in this uh, region. Uh, Grand Junction, the site of mills and many, many mines located around Grand Junction. If you were there before the Ur Uranium Mill Tailings Recovery Act, you would have seen tailings piles um, right along uh, the edge of uh, town, long uh, gone uh, now. But the uh, mining began, as I mentioned, in the early uh, 40s and continued as there was a need to have uh, the uranium that was used in the development of uh, nuclear weapons and later uh, for nuclear power. Just some pictures, you can see sort of the ubiquitous uh, labeling of everything as uranium, uranium downs, uranium prospector service. Many people went prospecting uh, for uh, uranium with the thought that they would get uh, rich. Some did, many uh, did not. Uh, the uh, Uranium Club, I like the phone number. Remember when there were only a few digits, but 950, I don't remember. You will find the Uranium Man at the Uranium Club. And uh, then of course, industry arriving, Union uh, Carbide, which had uh, mines and a mining town in uh, Yurvan here, uh, and a place where tailings were used uh, as foundational material. And later Yurvan was um, abandoned the housing because of very high levels of radon. A few important figures, Charlie Steen, uh, who made some of the first big uh, discoveries made a lot of money and uh, lost it. Uh, and then a figure I'll point out that many of you may know, Gino Sacamano. Gino was the pathologist in Grand Junction, the only one on the Western Slope. Uh, he uh, really developed the techniques of sputum cytology. The story is that the problem with um, doing cytology was separating the cells from the mucus he solved that when he took a specimen home at lunch and put it in his wife's wearing blender, shown here, uh, and uh, found that a short spin in the blender would separate the uh, cells from the uh, mucus and made possible uh, sputum uh, cytology. Uh, Gino made many contributions early on, and I had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with him on uh, multiple issues. So important Coloradan here. Yurvan we saw already. And then a lot of the early mines uh, in Colorado, Colorado Plateau, were literally so-called dog holes. Hill, holes dug into the sides of hills with relatively rich uh, uranium, or later came mechanization. But one key challenge with these mines is likely that exposures were very high to uh, radon and radon progeny. Now, from the Colorado study, evidence began to emerge pretty early on after the cohort was established in the early 1950s. It numbered about 3,600 um, non-Native American uh, miners and another seven or 800 uh, who were primarily Navajo. So these are the observed lung cancer cases versus the expected in reports that came from uh, the uh, Colorado Plateau miners study. So you can see 1959, six observed, three expected, of course, a relative risk of two, not statistically significant, but then the results quickly became very clear in showing an excess of lung cancer. And at the time, there were a number of meetings of the governors in uh, this part of the country to say what 
should be done. And, and of course, most critical was controlling the levels of radon in the mines through uh, ventilation. That study uh, continues and is part of a pooling effort uh, of the underground miner studies that I'll describe later on. This is the most recent uh, published uh, paper. And here you can note the extraordinary death rate from lung cancer, 22% uh, of the deaths between 1960 and 2005 from uh, lung cancer. So the, uh, and of course the impact has been uh, substantial. This is a relatively, uh, well, not so recent story anymore about the uh, uranium widows, the compensation issues uh, related to uh, the underground mining. So I wanna to turn to New Mexico because from um, the later 50s into the 60s, the industry shifted to uh, New Mexico because of some very large uh, rich deposits that were found, particularly out about 80, 90 miles northwest of Albuquerque, uh, past Grants, uh, New Mexico. And I'll show you some pictures. There were other deposits there as, uh, as well. Uh, again, uh, the uranium ministry had its impact. This is the uranium cafe in Grants. I was through there about <clears throat> six months ago and it looks like there is no more uranium uh, cafe. This is me a long time ago, about 1980, about to go look at an underground uh, mine. Uh, I had arrived in New Mexico in 78 to take the position that Linda described and quickly became involved in um, developing and then leading a cohort study, a prospective study of the New Mexico miners. This is a little bit of the scenery. This is the Jackpile mine which was the world's largest open pit uranium mine at the time. This is adjacent to Laguna Pueblo, about 50 miles west of Albuquerque. You can just get a feel for the scope of the mine, which just wandered on for miles with these enormous uh, trucks uh, hauling out uh, ore. And then the uh, underground mines, the area where the mine is working called the Stope, and uh, again, you can see no smoking underground, uh, hardly adhered to since miners were underground for a full work ship, shift of eight hours plus. Ventilation, bringing in air low in radon, done with these ventilation shafts that moved large amounts of air into the mines. And often in distance, you can see a tailings pile uh, over here, running probably a quarter mile long and 100 feet um, high. This is underground with the uh, air low in radon uh, being brought out to the stope where the miner is uh, working uh, here. And then this is the final product at the mills, so-called yellow cake U308 that uh, was then shipped off um, depending on the company to Oklahoma for Kerr-McGee, for example, for further uh, processing. Just some Feeling for the scenery again, um, tailings, uh, tailings on a windy day. And not surprisingly, the radionuclides in the tailings were scattered far and wide and, uh, you know, entered the uh, ecosystems, higher levels in animals, grass, vegetation, uh, adjacent to the tailings piles. Uh, environmental contamination this is a spill uh, from a tailings pond. Uh, at Church Rock, New Mexico, into the Rio Puerco that uh, contaminated with long-lived uh, radionuclides. And then other problems, the social problems of the industry, uh, the transient nature, the boom and bust cycles that have affected mining of all sorts. This is Jay Lickers, uh, Jay's Lickers out at uh, Ambrosia Lake. We were doing some studies where we were coming on and off shift with the um, miners and there'd be a massive line of trucks at Jay's buying uh, six packs at the drive up window. And about 15, 20 miles away, there was a huge wire basket at the interstate where all the empty six packs were tossed as every truck uh, went by. Now, again, the, the evidence of lung cancer problem was quickly evident. This is a paper we published in 1984 on uh, uranium mining and lung cancer in Navajo men that we did through the New Mexico Tumor Registry. 
we had all cases of lung cancer among Navajo males. When we did the study, there had only been 32. The Navajo smoked very little at the time. We had, for the 32 cases, we had 64 controls. 23 of the 32 cases had been minors. None of the 64 controls had. So the relative risk here was, you know, infinite. And then essentially all the lung cancer, most of it in the Navajo at the time was caused by their exposures in the uranium mining industry. And this is just a map of where the cases were. And they were sitting right here in this uh, area, primarily where mining had uh, gone on. The youngest was uh, in uh, his early 30s uh, of, of these cases. And then in our cohort study, we began again a group following up a group of over 3,000 men uh, who were underground miners with at least a year of experience. And if you look, you can see that the, there was a fourfold excess of lung cancer in this group. And this is a group who had worked under more favorable conditions than those in the uh, Colorado Plateau. So there was a rich history in this part of the country. And I'm just gonna give you a very quick summary of <clears throat> what, we, um, what we know. So this is the uh, radon uh, decay series beginning with radium-226. Radon-222 is a noble gas. It decays into a series of particulate uh, progeny or daughters, so-called. And two of them are the polonium-218 and polonium-214 decay uh, with release of an alpha particle. And it's when these alpha releases occur from particulate progeny, typically attached to some sort of particles that they found in the air, occur when these decays occur with the deposit of polonium, the alpha particles penetrate the respiratory epithelium and have enough energy to uh, hit cells in the basal layer. Remember, they're high energy, so they damage, they can destroy DNA, they can cause strand breaks. And the, uh, this is very well documented, what they can do in single cell experiments that go back um, into the 80s and 90s. There are also uh, bystander effects uh, that have been shown in experimental systems. I will say we also know a lot about where the doses of alpha energy are delivered. We have longstanding uh, lung models. So this story of radon and lung cancer is very well described. One of the, one of the controversies has been, well, what about indoor air? We have lower concentrations. How could low concentrations of radon indoors cause cancer? And the, the answer is really simple and obvious, and it's on this figure. The energy of these alpha particles that do the damage, the circles here, don't, that energy of decay does not depend on the concentration. That's a property of nature. And the same concentration is delivered whether you're in an underground uranium mine with high levels or you're in a home with far lower levels. There's just less likelihood of a hit. So it makes sense that there would be no safe level of exposure, the potential to cause lung cancer at any level of exposure and, and low dose linearity for the exposure response relationship is biologically um, very consistent with what we know about the mechanism of carcinogenesis. There's also very robust epidemiological evidence. I've, some of this goes back a century now, as you saw at the start. And then we have multiple cohorts probably about 20 different cohorts of radon exposed um, underground miners. We've repeatedly pooled these data sets and from the miners studies and looked at the risks and looked at the uh, excess. We've also done studies of radon indoors. These are very simple studies in a sense. They're case control studies going to the homes and prior homes of people with lung cancer and measuring radon and finding controls, people control homes, people without lung cancer, and doing the same thing. And again, the risks measured in these studies uh, roughly parallel those from the uh, miners. So as I said, we have robust data. Uh, 
This is a picture from the early 90s when the principal investigators of the 11 studies that were pooled met uh, to talk about the uh, pooling project. And this is a monograph we put out um, with the Journal of the National Cancer Institute describing uh, what we found in these 11 cohorts and the uh, risks. One, one other important question has been, what about smoking and radon? And some of the cohorts, including the New Mexico cohort, have data on smoking. And it's turned out there's a, there is synergism between the two. It's submultiplicative, which means essentially the risks, the combined risk is not what you get by multiplying the risk of smoking, the risk of radon exposure, but somewhat less. But of course, this means that smokers are at greater, uh, are at increased risk of lung cancer, and that there's a burden of lung cancer in the workers and in the population that comes from this combined effect of smoking and uh, radon. So th the risk assessment question has dominated a lot of the work on radon uh, since the indoor radon problem I was identified in the United States in the 80s. Actually, uh, to give fair credit, it was the subject of a doctoral dissertation in Sweden in the early 1950s. So it was a recognized problem, but this is the uh, watcher's home. And the, the challenge around um, radon has been that some homes like the watcher's home have extremely high levels and nobody would want to live in them. And many homes, most of the exposure comes at much lower levels. So there's this log normal kind of distribution of concentrations in homes. So on this scale, the watcher's home, you can see here's for the EPA guideline. The watcher's home is the thousands way out in the tail and other such homes have been identified. Nobody would want to live in them. But then since most of the exposure comes from these lower levels, it's been this question of, well, how do we just make sure that we reduce radon exposure as much as we can? Radon was the leading contributor to radiation exposure in the U.S. population until displaced over the last couple of decades by medical uh, uses of radiation. So that's been the mitigation challenge. How do we find the high homes? And what do we do about all the lower homes that have to be contributing to our background of uh, lung cancer? So this um, has you know, been very controversial over the years, although I will say sort of in the last couple of decades, uh, the, uh, I've heard far less controversy about the indoor radon story, perhaps because they've settled uh, down uh, with it. And I think the science is recognized as secure, I think particularly since the Beer 6 report that I mentioned. So in looking at this, there have been committees and reports over time, and some of them are highlighted in these boxes, different groups that have looked at what the risks might be. And for example, here are the beer reports, the UN with its unskier reports out here and, uh, and others. We had made efforts to assure that all the studies of lung cancer related to radon in homes could be pooled. And that exercise was completed 15 plus years ago. And I'm going to tell you about our most recent effort to pull all this together and something called PUMA, the pooled underground miner, uh, pooled uranium miner analysis, that is uh, a very large data set giving new insights on the uh, risks. And let's see, let me skip these and uh, let's go on. So these uh, reports, these biological effects of ionizing radiation or beer reports, had a, had a really important um, role in developing approaches for understanding radon risks and for giving tools to decision makers um, on that, that provide guidance on how to set uh, guidelines or exposure limits. So I mentioned um, Beer 4, and that, that report, which was released in 1988, we brought together data from four studies of um, underground miners and did analyses that were pioneering at the time and would seem trivial um, today. But we 
produced data-based risk models that could be used to um, guide particularly EPA in saying what were the risks of uh, indoor radon and what could, um, how could we reduce those risks with different approaches. I will say, I don't want to forget the underground um, miners and that's uranium and other uh, minerals who actually still remain exposed to fairly, can remain exposed to fairly high levels of radon uh, progeny. And then the Beer 6 report, which was released in 1998, six years in the making, involved a great deal of original data analysis using this data set that I mentioned of the 11 studies of underground miners. And I think a couple of uh, important things. Uh, we found that risk goes down as time lengthens since exposure. Uh, it also depends on the rate at which exposure is received, a lower rate of exposure, higher risk. And a, with age, the risk drops off. So some of these features of the risk were well characterized in a model. And using this model, we had developed somewhere around 16,000 to 21,000 uh, lung cancer deaths a year in the United States attributable to radon. Uh, what that means is that if magically in the so-called counterfactual levels of radon in homes were reduced to outdoor levels, there would be around 20,000 lung cancer cases, deaths that would not uh, occur. So when radon is referred to as the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking, which of course has a far larger number of lung cancer deaths. It's based on this uh, analysis. And uh, for those of you who would like to see the guts of a risk model, here uh, it is. And basically it says the risk of radon depends on exposure, the age of exposure, and the rate at which exposure has been received. And there's some other models with the similar sorts of uh, formulation. So this is what uh, the Environmental Protection Agency with some modification has been relying on. The, the empirical data, one of the critical questions is, well, what about the low levels of exposure where you know, people in homes, what people in homes receive? Again, I'm not gonna describe for you the exposure or dose measures here, but here are the data going down for our, our lower exposed miners. And you can see that the uh, risk is evident at lower and lower levels and more or less drops off in a linear fashion. And I'll show you that the same is true in our new updated analysis. So this next step in the um, risk modeling is uh, the pooled underground miner analysis that I mentioned, uh, or PUMA, that's an international collaboration um, led by an epidemiologist, David Richardson, who recently moved to the University of California, Irvine. And Again, what we felt was that there's still these questions that we could nail down better. What are the risks at lower levels of exposure? Uh, we could better explore age as a contributor, look at other cancers, and look at um, uh, non-malignant respiratory diseases, uh, which remain of interest. So here are the different cohorts included in this um, analysis. I think Particularly prominent is a new cohort from uh, Germany who were miners uh, working in the former East, um, East Germany. Uh, and you can see that there's an addition now of 53,000 plus um, underground uranium miners. So this is a bit different from the 11 cohorts pooled, still includes the New Mexico cohort and the uh, Colorado uh, cohort. Uh, exposures were measured in different ways in these um, mines, but all of them have estimates of what the exposures of the individual miners were. In New Mexico, we spent years doing the dose uh, reconstruction, exposure reconstruction um, exercise. And again, different methods uh, employed. Now, moving on, this is the ratio of observed deaths to expected. 
in this very large group, disparate group of miners. But just a few things to note that there's a roughly doubling 1.90 risk of dying from lung cancer in the cohort, not surprisingly, a high risk of dying of silicosis, a high risk of dying of external causes. Um, mining is uh, dangerous. And in the New Mexico miners early on, we saw a very high rate of uh, deaths, um, particularly from uh, mine related accidents. And of course, with all the travel back and forth with uh, travel. But we're able with this cohort to look not only at lung cancer, but other cancers and other diseases where some questions have been uh, raised. Uh, just, just to say that the um, risk of dying, this is now for um, different uh, factors, varies with uh, for lung cancer with when people were hired in, being higher early on, not surprisingly, or with longer duration of um, employment, just what we would um, expect. Let me skip this one and go on. So one of the powers of this new data set is the ability to look at lower levels of exposure than before. I showed you a plot like this from the 11 minor pooling, the scale went up to 400. Now we have a lot of data at much lower levels showing uh, with uh, the look here at the extra risk due to radon exposure, that's what's on the y-axis, this more or less linear relationship, quite linear relationship of uh, risk of cancer related to how much exposure the miners had. So we're using this data set to redevelop uh, risk models based on uh, these new data. We're doing that because there's still many people exposed to radon, both occupationally um, and in their homes. So these are some of the work settings. I still get calls from time to time about um, buildings with high radon uh, levels uh, that really very much depends on sort of the microgeology of, of the location, but I've seen, I've uh, been contacted about places with uh, very low, low, high levels in basements uh, or in uh, places where um, communications uh, cabling uh, comes in uh, after being underground. So it's still a problem. Then, of course, here in Colorado um, and elsewhere, the indoor radon problem uh, remains. These are data from CDPHE just showing home radon test levels by county uh, where 48.2% of these screening levels, these are biased upwards a bit, uh, are above that EPA guideline of four. Uh, there's been discussion about lowering the guideline. I will say that many of you have perhaps tested your homes for indoor um, radon concentration. Um, the way that homes are tested, if they're done on the screening test by EPA, the results are going to be biased upwards from the average concentration just by the nature of uh, how the tests are done. So I want to end a little bit by talking about the legacy of uranium mining uh, for this part of the country and the United States. I will say that uranium mining uh, persists uh, worldwide, and I don't think we have a very good fix on uh, what the risks are who are faced by um, the current under the current uh, uranium miners, although uh, much of it is now done uh, in open mines rather than uh, underground. But just a, a few things. So the one of the critical issues around the Colorado Plateau miners relates to whether when that industry began, enough was known about the lung cancer risk that more steps should have been taken to end it. You remember that industry began in the early 50s, and by then it was quite clear that there had been a European experience of increased lung cancer in the mines in uh, Schneeberg and uh, Jakobsthal. The um, dosimetry of radon had been worked out to uh, an extent in the early um, 50s. Uh, 
the advisory committee on human radiation experiments that uh, President Clinton set up in the uh, 90s said, in fact, that a study should not have been done, if you will, but steps taken uh, to protect the miners. These are some of the key figures. Robley Matt Evans was at MIT. He's the one who worked out the uh, radium doll painter story and made some of the first measurements, which were samples of gas collected in mines and flown to MIT for his measures. Uh, Duncan Holliday, who worked out the exposure work, Eisenbud early in uh, terms of worker safety, Langan Swint, who worked for Homestake Mining and was concerned about worker health, and some early publications that laid out much of the story and what was known. So, and, and in fact, uh, and important for the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, the Atomic Energy Commission <laughs> was the only client for uh, uranium uh, through 1967. So it should have taken responsibility for worker health, but in reality, it did not. And, and while great attention was great attention was put to worker health in other parts of the emerging nuclear complex, the miners, perhaps uh, out of sight out here in the Rocky Mountain West, were um, were largely uh, forgotten for quite some time, which was part of why, again, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act eventually um, passed. Stuart Udall was the Secretary of the Interior under uh, Kennedy. Um, I think the Udall name is probably known to many of you who are in this part of the uh, country. Uh, his son, Tom, recently left the uh, New Mexico Senate. Stuart, um, filed a case on behalf of a group of Navajo miners against the government, the uh, so-called the Begay uh, case. And it lost in the courts um, in large part because of the uh, time since the uh, injury. But the judge said that uh, in fact, what would be needed would be a federal act to uh, compensate those miners who had been uh, harmed by developing lung cancer and other uh, diseases because of their work during a time when the government did not protect um, their health. This is uh, the Begay uh, case. Now, what happened then was that the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was passed, and uh, this provided compensation to the so-called downwinders and also the underground uh, uranium miners. Uh, later millers have been covered um, as, uh, as well. When, when originally formulated, the act had problems. It had problems in its linkage of its provisions to the uh, science. It did cover people who had worked during a certain time period in certain parts of the, um, of the country. And here's this overlap uh, for example, this area around St. George's, Utah, where uh, fallout went. So the downwinders and the uh, miners covered, as I mentioned. The um, act with its problems uh, needed, uh, needed revision. And I, at the time I was in New Mexico and then later at Hopkins, worked with the New Mexico delegation, de delegation to look at how it should be revised. And in the end gave uh, quite lengthy uh, testimony uh, for its um, revision. Here's a letter to Senator Hatch uh, with uh, the written version of that uh, testimony. So I was pleased when the act received appropriate amendments in uh, 2000. And again, as I mentioned now, it's uh, with its longevity, with it reaching at the end of its authorized period, there's discussion about what comes next with RECA. When, uh, when I was in New Mexico in a, in a program that is still ongoing through a hospital, a land grant hospital in Raton, New Mexico, we had an extensive outreach program for miners and screened thousands uh, for potential compensation, particularly um, on uh, the Navajo uh, nation, looking at the former Navajo uh, miners. This is that uh, truck out in the uh, field.
the uh, Navajo Nation was hit, I think, uh, particularly hard, both in terms of the very high levels of radon that the miners received, these very small mines that dotted parts of the reservation, the use of uh, tailings and other materials in construction, environmental demand damage like the uh, church rock spill, and uh, health concerns, uh, reproductive outcomes, cancer, renal disease, other health effects that are the subject of investigation by a number of institutions, uh, including UNM and uh, Northern Arizona uh, University. And here's a few of the books on uh, that uh, topic. So I'm gonna end here with a couple of good books to uh, read. This book by Ray Ringholtz uh, does a very nice job of getting into the very colorful history of the industry in this part of the uh, country. Uh, the Zollner book, I think, gives a very broad perspective on uh, uranium, certainly a uh, mineral that has shaped much of what has happened um, over the last, what now, 70, 80, uh, 80 years. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk. And I think we have plenty of time left for questions and uh, comments. So thanks for the uh, invite and let's go on to a conversation. Thank you very much, John. Um, while people are kind of getting their thoughts together, and please, I, I would like you know people just jump in. Um, I, I did have a question just to start out. So given that there is the, the level of radon mitigation that's going on in especially residential, but also commercial buildings and such um, in Colorado, is this a natural experiment? Is there some way we could capitalize on just what has happened to actually see an impact on lung cancer incidence? Or is the, um, um, the, are the exposures too low? Yeah, so great question. And let me say one thing. Most people don't live in the same house forever. And, you know, so I showed you the concentration of radon in homes. It gets a little complicated, but in fact, if you look at the population exposure accrued across a lifetime, we don't have that much difference in exposure. So it's not an easy thing to look at sort of people living in mitigated versus unmitigated homes. Uh, for example, there were some very famous but flawed analyses done early on that were ecological, the kinds of things you're sort of talking about by a physicist at Pittsburgh named Bernie Cohen. Uh, and he showed a negative association between county level radon and uh, mm. lung cancer risk. Mm. And he offered a prize to anybody who could explain that. <laughs> and in fact, what's the uh, explanation of course was confounding by smoking, which was well shown he refused to give the prize. So um, I, 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 think, um, I think the answer is no, the natural experiment is underway. I, frankly, it's hard to even get your hands on, and I've tried how many homes have been mitigated around the US. So we don't, we don't have really good data. And, and that said, there are people who think we should be lowering the uh, exposure guideline. Uh, Jamie uh, Stutes has a question. Jamie, do you just want to ask your question? Ask away, I Jamie. see you there. Yeah. Sure, sure, John. Thank you very much. That was more of the story than I've ever heard before, and I really appreciate it. Um, what kind of protocols are being used to screen minors in those programs now? And in, are they using any of those protocols to screen minor, yeah. other uranium miners and uh, or, or other miners across the country? Right, right. You know, it's a great question. In fact, one of the things I did before I left New Mexico was I did a lot of pilot work for what could have been a really important investigation of, you know, sort of early indicators. And, you know, what I wanted to do was to build a sort of biobank um, of blood, both blood specimens, sputum, and we actually had a bronchoscopy protocol to see if we could find early um, indicators. To my knowledge, and I can actually, this is something I can sort of verify with the folks who are running the program in Raton. I'm not sure they have a screening program specific to the minors. 
And, uh, you know, that's different from the question of whether they should be. They're certainly at high risk. And, um, you know, I, I'm just not aware right now of whether they have formally brought screening um, to, uh, to the miners. I mean, it, it certainly would be a geographic challenge because they're scattered about, but I'll, I'll, I'll find out and let you know. Um, I might be able to ask, answer that because okay. Akshay sued now runs that program out of Rattan. And so that same semi that you just showed still goes um, across the state. And so it's widely advertised for it. So it goes around the state and they have x-ray screening capabilities. They can draw blood, they can do. So they do do um, x-ray screening. Um, yeah, that's but they don't have CT, which is what they do not have CT. They have X-ray screening at this at this point, but they do get to they they are seen by a physician as well at the same screening, a pulmonologist at the same time. More questions for John. I I know there has to be more questions. I don't want to monopolize this. I have a quick question. Um, <laughs> Is there a propensity for any of the different subtypes of lung cancer with radon exposure? You know, I mean, the, 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 real, the real answer is we don't know. And then, you know, early on, there was a description of um, small cell lung cancers in non-smoking underground miners, which some thought might be, a clue. That, that really hasn't... Um, held up. And, you know, I searched and when I was doing these beer reports, I kept track of that literature pretty closely and didn't find um, anything, you know, and then this question, I think, um, I think in 1992, uh, in collaboration with Kurt Harris at NCI, we published a paper looking for, quote, molecular signatures. And we had um, smoking and non-smoking miners and non-miners. So we had that sort of two by two table and we used some pretty primitive, very primitive stuff by today's standards and didn't find anything. And, you know, in a, in a sense, when I thought about it, these, the, the way that if, if these alpha particles are sort of like bowling balls rolling through cells, it seems unlikely that we would find a specific signature. I mean, that was you know, my thinking afterwards, as opposed to, you know, say the story with uh, benzoapyrene and P53, where we have something far more uh, specific. Uh, so I, I think the easy, the short answer right now is no, and there've been, so there's been some searching. Other questions for Dr. Samet? Dr. Samuel, this is Fernando. This will be a, a home question. So you, you mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that just like tobacco, there's no a small amount of radon exposure that is safe. So from that perspective, would you recommend that any homeowner should uh, have a, their crawl space uh, control for radon management? <laughs> you know, I've, I've answered an awful lot of radon questions over the years. And, you know, and I will say some of them have been really tough. I mean, you know, so sort of, you know, when I was in New Mexico, sort of the uh, nice sort of low air exchange solar house with a whole bunch of rock in the middle with high radon levels and a, you know, brick on sand floor. Those places are a problem. I mean, you know, you really have a mitigation problem. The, um, I, I think, you know, from the point of view of should you measure your indoor radon concentration, the easy answer is why not? I mean, it's cheap. And if you do a long-term track at sort of detect, one of the longer-term detectors, you'll get a good read on what the level is. And if it were, you know, above four or something, you can mitigate. I think as you go, as you go down that, then the question comes up of whether you can, you know, can mitigate the costs of putting in, you know, a fan to ventilate a crawl space you know, maybe runs a couple thousand dollars plus electricity, say equivalent to a refrigerator or something per month. So if you say, well, how many carcinogens can I measure and control? 
I think my N is about one. So, you know, it's certainly at the sense time of purchasing a home, it really makes sense. I think if you're in an area where homes have been identified with high levels, make a measurement, you know, and I think from there, it really becomes sort of a matter of personal risk taking. If you're 3.5 on a long-term measurement, you want to say, well, I could bring that down to two. Uh, you know, then that that's sort of a, you know, a, a decision. But certainly I urge everybody, you know, at the time of purchase, particularly in areas, you know, where there's been high rate on homes with high rate on found to, to make that measurement. Thank you. Yeah. John, this is Jamie again. I think it also gets a bit thorny when we get into, when we start thinking about public spaces and uh, such as schools and, and things of that nature. And wondering if you have any um, enlightened thoughts on that uh, challenge. Well, you asked for enlightened thoughts. I don't know about that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of work on healthy schools. I, I will say with uh, sort of the level of ventilation in most schools and constructions, I'm, I'm not aware of the finding of a lot of schools with high rate on levels. You know, Jamie, I mean, going back to this, there was a lot of focus on schools. It's a long time ago. Uh, and I don't think much turned up, but here I'm really sort of... Um, testing my uh, testing my memory. I mean, I, there have been, you know, I mean, I, as I mentioned, I've been contacted about workplaces with true radon problems, big properties. Uh, so it can still, you know, happen um, just depending on construction. Yeah, so there's a note here about free short-term tests. And I, the only thing about the short-term tests and, and John Adgate has a comment here about the long-term. So. Those are the alpha track detectors, and they're not expensive, and you can buy them. And um, the EPA protocol, if you use the uh, test according to the protocol, you're supposed to put it on the lowest potentially habitable level, which means if you have an unfinished basement, but it could be a place of habitation, you put it there. And in theory, it should be closed house conditions during the time of testing. So you're sort of biasing everything upwards. But if you're settled in your home and you want to test, go as John A. Gates suggests and get one of those long-term uh, tests. And there's, and there's lots of radon contractors out there too. Any other questions for Dr. Samet? Then this is a great area. I uh, saw the map you show us uh, uh, HHS region eight, uh, yep. those states, um, and uh, Colorado always has been leader in this region in other health outcomes. Did you identify someone to work with you in their career development award to NIH? To work on radon? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure too many people should make their careers out of radon, but. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's certainly part of the lung cancer story. And, you know, at one point there was a, you know, I'm just going back historically and there was a Department of Energy had a substantial radon program going back into the 80s and 90s. And in fact, Colorado State um, in its now Department of Environment and Radiological Sciences had a number of um, very uh, active uh, investigators in the area of um, of uh, radon and its uh, health effects. I just think it's uh, an incredibly interesting exposure. And I think anybody interested in lung cancer should certainly know the radon part of the um, part of the story. But I, and, and Chen, going back to the part of your question, certainly was on, when I was in New Mexico, I had any number of uh, folks who were in the group who were working on the uh, uh, radon uh, underground miner story. And in practicing medicine in that part of the country, being a pulmonologist, you know, we saw plenty, unfortunately, of uh, former underground miners who had lung cancer. I mean, it was just uh, an inevitable, um, unfortunately, particularly the VA uh, 
Thank you. <laughs> so we're at the top of the hour. Um, John, I would like to thank you for this very, very interesting talk. And please, everyone, join me in thanking John for um, this, uh, giving us a lot to uh, to think about. And very, there's lots of positive comments for you in the chat room if you want to look at those real quick before you log off, John. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I love to talk about this in case you can't tell. So nice to have an opportunity to do so. So bye, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>